Welcome to today's Discovery Series lecture featuring Dr. Michael K. Thomas, who's an Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Thomas's research focuses on the cultural dimensions of technology implementation in learning contexts and what this means for the design of technology-rich innovations for learning. And today we'll discuss designing experiences in games and simulations to support diversity, equity, and inclusion. Please post any questions you have for Dr. Thomas in the chat, and we will get to these at the end of his presentation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas to the College of Information. Thank you so much for being here. It's good to see you. Thank you so much. I, I, I really appreciate it. and. Um, so glad to see you all here. Um, a couple quick things about, um, about myself. Uh, I'm here in Chicago at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And as was mentioned, I'm faculty in the uh, Department of Educational Psychology. And I serve as, uh, as department chair. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit today about uh, fun things such as games. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. Ah! Okay. And kapow. Okay. So for the past couple of uh, decades, I've been thinking a lot about uh, technology and using technology. And most of the contexts that I've had to deal with are in contexts that complicate the notion of uh, culture. And this aligns with ideas such as uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think that when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're actually talking about uh, principles or concepts or ideas that are uh, interrelated. They are mutually affirming. And we might say that they are uh, symbiotic, which means that uh, they're inherently connected, they're inherently interwoven, and they affirm or, or strengthen one another. But I wanted to begin by talking a little bit about the context that we're in right now. And the context that we're in right now is a very, very complicated one primarily, I think, because of technology. Technology is remaking our relationship with one another and also our relationship with, um, with the world, really. And we can see this in all kinds of professions, such as uh, the elevator operator, which is a profession that we don't see anymore. Uh, we can see that drones have uh, remade our uh, cityscape and our media. This is an example of a Walmart truck without a driver. And this is an example of a taxi service that also does not have uh, a driver. Uh, you know, my sister, she has a, a Tesla. And I drove this car myself. And let me tell you something, this car does drive itself. I know it's not perfect. It's not quite there yet, but this is really uh, a game changer, uh, this technology. This is an example of, a, um, of really an Android, of an artificial person designed to interact uh, with people in healthcare and elder care uh, environments uh, from Japan. Um, this helps to deal with issues related to not only care, but also with, uh, with loneliness. So what does all this mean? Um, we can't really 
anticipate what all of this new realignments of technology will mean. But we do know that it means that we will continually and incessantly have to learn how to learn. Learning is at the key of this. And it's learning for the purpose of doing what is good in the world and doing what will hopefully uh, preserve the world. Because of course, the world is our common home. And of course, we share a common fate. Uh, but I want to be a person who um, is inherently optimistic. And I think that people who are involved in education and design for learning, we are inherently optimistic. And the reason that we're inherently optimistic is that the results of what we do in educational context, we may not ever see. Uh, I used to be an elementary school teacher years ago in, in New York City public schools. And the children that I interacted with then, they're grownups now, but I did not expect to be able to uh, see the results of the seeds that were planted all those years ago. So the educator, the instructional designer, the person that is uh, devoted to the learning environment is really saying uh, no to despair. And of course, yes to hope. But we're doing this in a world where there are still uh, all kinds of problems uh, that we're dealing with. And we are not done with problems uh, such as prejudice. We're not done with issues related to um, all manner of exclusion. We're not done with oppression even, um, which means that we have to uh, devote ourselves not only to learning, but to affirming the world that we want to live in. And so when we create learning environments and when we do research, what we're doing is we are creating representations. Uh, a piece of research is a representation of people. Um, a learning environment that we design, a piece of software, a game that we might design to teach people things is a representation. And representation matters, uh, matters a lot. Uh, the images here, by the way, um, years ago, I had a friend at uh, Indiana University who happened to be from Nigeria. And he was uh, really happy one day because he, he said that his, um, uh, his son, his first son was born. So he was excited about becoming a dad. So I asked him about his child and I asked, uh, what's your son's name? And he said, my son's name is Otto Benga. So I said, oh, is that, um, uh, what does that mean in your language? Or does that, um, um, is that a common name uh, where you're from in Nigeria? And he said, no, Otto Benga was a person. And this is the person in this image on the right. Um, he was from a, a group of people that used to be called uh, pygmy people from the central part of, um, of Africa. And he was taken from there and ended up living for years as part of an exhibit at the Bronx Zoo, okay? So uh, you can Google the story of, um, of Otto Benga. So of course we may create learning environments, but they have to be learning environments that are not only empowering in terms of learning, but are also empowering in terms of making the world uh, a, better, uh, a better place. And of course, this takes practice. Um, I'm, I, I, I regard myself as an optimistic person, but I also think that all of these things are things that we have to practice, that we have to work on over a long period of time. So if you're learning something complicated, 
like how to play a Mozart sonata, you don't just sit down and do it. Uh, it might take a lot of practice with a lot of mistakes and doing something over and over and over and over again uh, before you've really learned it well. And the same is true for uh, the design of environments that really affirm diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I want to shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about one of my uh, interests, and that's in the design of games. And so I'm borrowing a lot of this information from the work of uh, Jim G, James Paul G, who um, most recently was at um, Arizona State University and formerly at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he wrote a very nice book about uh, games and learning that was very uh, influential called uh, What Games Have to Teach Us About Literacy and Learning. So I recommend it. And some of these ideas here I'm borrowing from, uh, from Jim G. All right, so I'm going to rhetorically uh, ask you, uh, what is this? What is this thing that we're looking at here? Well, it looks a lot like this thing here, but in what ways is that different from this? And in what ways is that different from this? What about this thing right here? What is this? Or I might say, who? is this. And what about this? Consider again this and this and this and this. What's important here is that we're dealing with symbols. We're dealing with symbols that appear in contexts that are rich in the ways that the symbol gives meaning and conveys emotion in these different contexts. And so context becomes everything for all of these uh, symbols. And the development of learning environments, the design of learning experiences necessarily evolves the use of symbols in context. Consider the contexts here. And then consider the ways in which, in which we mix words and images together in learning environments. And so as it turns out, games or gaming environments or simulations are very multimodal. They mix words and images. And they do this in a semiotic domain which is an area or a set of activities where people think, act, and value in certain ways. And a semiotic domain, semiotic uh, symbol, right? Any set of practices that recruits one or more modalities to communicate distinctive types of meanings. So when we learn a new semiotic domain in a way that is more active rather than passive, we learn to experience the world in new ways. Since semiotic domains are shared by groups of people who carry them on as distinctive social practices, we gain the potential to join the social group uh, of the semiotic domain and become affiliated with such kinds of people. And we gain resources that prepare us for future learning and problem solving in the domain and related domains. So some examples of semiotic domains, semi, uh, cellular biology, is a semiotic domain. Uh, a first person shooter video game, this genre of video game is a semiotic domain. Uh, wine connoisseurship uh, is a uh, semiotic domain. 
Uh, rap music is a semiotic domain. So I want to uh, emphasize that diversity, equity, and inclusion, or designing experiences that, experiences that support diversity, equity, inclusion. It's all about creating uh, contexts while addressing the consequences of that work and also understanding the culture, both of the people who enter these learning environments and also the cultures that we are nurturing the emergence of. All right, I wanna uh, look at um, some examples um, of this. When we are uh, exploring a new environment, we explore the environment by way of uh, these symbols, but the symbols occur in some sort of cultural context. So if we look at this image, by the way, we can notice that there are many little things that contribute to how we read this context, this culture, this uh, environment. Imagine seeing this for the first time and consider how all of these little things have little bits of meaning. Oh, look at this arcane bit of writing here. How do we make sense of the elements that are designed into uh, the, this design work? And what is the meaning uh, of all of these things? How about this thing right here? Anybody play Yu-Gi-Oh or Magic the Gathering or Pokemon? Look at all of these little things that contribute to the making of this cultural artifact. So at the same time as we talk about how culture is written into these environments and therefore into the designed experience, we should also consider the notion of uh, cultural relevance, the relevance of the environment, uh, of the learning environment, of the design for the people who participate in it. So a couple more principles or ideas about games and learning. The first is that learning is active and not passive in a game environment. Games force the players, the people who inhabit the environment, to think about the design of the environment. They use multiple sign systems or semiotics, and the player learns to take risks without real life consequences. It involves identity play, taking on the epistemic frame of reference of experts, and leveling for greater power, privilege, and respect in a zone of proximal development. I'll explain those. But first, let's take a look at a, at a couple popular games. You see all these little pictures at the bottom and along the side here? Well, what do they all mean? I know what each one of them means, but I didn't learn them all at once. I learned them one at a time in a context where that thing was very meaningful. Games also involve identity. They involve taking on or trying on the perspective of a different person or being or a creature, and then interacting with others in that environment. That's role play. Now there's all kinds of uh, games that have been developed that have played with this uh, notion of identity. But of course, these were not always the kinds of uh, affirming environments 
that we might want to uh, create for learners. But many different uh, peoples throughout the world have uh, people of different constituencies have worked in game-like environments so as to uh, explore identity in the context of real life uh, conflict. Uh, this is an example, by the way, uh, from a company uh, called um, uh, Global Conflicts. There's a global conflict series. And what they do is they look at different conflicts around the world and you play through the environment um, so that you can engage different characters in the game environment and by doing so explore uh, the different constituencies in this, um, in this conflict. Uh, the United States military has made use of games for training people who are going on real life missions. This, uh, these are some screenshots from the game uh, Tactical Iraqi, which was designed for um, uh, real life military personnel going to uh, Iraq during the, uh, during the intervention there. And it was used to teach not only culture, uh, but also some aspects of uh, Arabic language. Many of these environments are very, very, very large environments uh, encompassing um, uh, hundreds of thousands of users. This game, EVE Online, was a single server uh, game that was uh, massively, massively uh, large. Um, so I want to uh, talk a little bit about the term gamification because many people have looked at learning environments and they've thought, well, how can we take aspects of games and game mechanics and um, take these design uh, techniques in order to uh, engage learners, uh, to in, uh, improve learning and improve motivation? So uh, there's a, a variety of purposes here, but generally this involves the use of motivational techniques as well as uh, identity play to engage learners and to improve learning. I wanted to focus on uh, specifically on seven aspects of games, uh, simulations or gamification. These are the use of fantasy, leveling systems, identity play, zones of proximal development, the idea of discovery, affinity groups, and testing trajectories. All right, the first is fantasy. And fantasy simply means that the activity in the learning environment is situated around a story. And that story might be uh, pure fantasy, or it might be more connected with uh, events that, um, that we experience in the real world, like some of the ones that we've uh, looked at. Uh, story is one of, the, um, one of the characteristics of really what it is to be human. We learn, we engage one another um, by telling stories and using language, and this is how we grow. Leveling systems are all around us, and a leveling system is a system that involves um, moving from uh, one status station to another, right? And leveling systems are all around us. You might uh, start as a um, assistant professor, and then become an associate professor, and then a full professor, and then, uh, uh, I don't know, a distinguished professor or uh, an atomic professor. Um, anyway, moving up through a leveling system. These are military ranks. Uh, there's the martial arts belt system. Leveling systems are all around us. And all of these involve uh, not just uh, a change, in uh, the symbol of the different level, 
but also more access to privilege, uh, power, and secrets, okay? And again, they're all around us. Uh, by the way, if you ever want um, your students to listen to you, uh, just tell them that, um, uh, that you're about to tell them a secret and not to tell anyone and say, this won't leave this room. This is a secret. <laughs> um, people find secrets compelling, of course. And access to secrets uh, represents power and privilege. All right, the, uh, the next is identity playing, and that means trying on being someone that you're not. Uh, children do this uh, naturally. In fact, if you watch children on a playground, they will constantly take on different identities. Um, I am the store manager. I am the person who is shopping. Um, I am the, uh, the policeman. They're playing cops and robbers, right? And then when they take on that other identity, they take on certain ways of talking. They will uh, pretend to use tools that are used by um, uh, the real life role that they're, um, that they're imitating or enacting. And they're also taking on a new way of seeing a new way of seeing uh, the world. And um, David Schaefer uh, refers to this as a different epistemic frame of reference. It's a new way of looking at the world and coming to know the world, right? Ontology is what we believe about reality. Epistemology is how it is that we come to uh, to know that world, right? And so by playing with a different identity, what we're able to do is try on the glasses, try on the way of seeing the world in, um, in a new way, using a different epistemic frame. And to understand expertise, we should do epistemography, of that expertise and understand how those experts see the world and come to know the world. Okay, so this is uh, identity uh, identity play, and we do this effectively when we pay attention to zones of proximal uh, development. This is an idea uh, you may be familiar with from uh, Lev Vygotsky. Uh, and others really. And it involves uh, learning at a level that is just above the current level. Uh, you might have experienced this with um, things that you've tried to learn yourself, right? Perhaps uh, maybe a foreign language. In some contexts, you might, let's say, look at a page uh, from a book in the language that you're trying to learn and you can't understand anything on the page. It's discouraging, right? But if you know everything on the page except one thing, that's encouraging, right? We want to be in that sweet spot between what is just too difficult and uh, what is too easy. If it's too easy, then it's boring and the learner disengages. And if it's too difficult, then it's discouraging. And again, uh, the learner disengages. So games do this very, very well because the player, um, uh, the inhabitant of the learning environment is able to uh, adjust the type of play, um, the speed of play uh, to their particular uh, level and then adjust uh, to their zone of proximal development. And Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, um, is a uh, psychologist who uh, made the claim that when we uh, engage in actions at that sweet spot level, that this learning is inherently pleasurable and we can enter what's called flow. 
Um, you might have heard people say that, oh yeah, I was in the zone. I was in a state of intense concentration uh, of high level performance. And um, it's, it's intensely pleasurable, um, but it's, uh, it's something that has to be in that uh, zone of proximal development. The other thing is that uh, games are very effective and that they usually involve discovering things rather than um, being told something. When we discover things, it turns out we remember them better. Uh, we're more motivated by it. We feel empowered by the notion of discovering, oh, what's under here? Oh, what's, what's that there? Oh, it turns out that this discovery uh, empowers me to do something else that I'm trying, uh, trying to do. Finding is more important than uh, telling. And we do this in, um, in affinity groups or groups of people who come together, not on the basis of a, uh, um, a particular ethnic identity or um, some other kind of uh, identity that a person is born with, but rather through a practice, through um, an interest. And these are also referred to as uh, communities of, um, of practice. Um, by the way, this is, um, uh, there's a wonderful book by, uh, by uh, Jean uh, Lave um, uh, that deals with this. And, and she looked particularly at tailors in Liberia and looked at how uh, that community of people developing that expertise uh, interacted in that, um, in that community. Uh, the book is called Legitimate Peripheral Participation. And also in games, we're able to test out trajectories. We're able to try things multiple times. And so you might, might remember uh, this film in which um, the main character is able to live a day in his life over and over and over and over again. And so uh, this is something that we can do in uh, games and in game-like environments. So we can try using these symbols in context over and over and over again to develop expertise while playing with identity and seeing the world in new kinds of ways. And as it turns out, this is highly motivating. Um, uh, this was a game, by the way, that I got so addicted to. Um, and what you do is you uh, take care of, um, of a horse, kind of like uh, there are many pet games out there. Uh, but just by doing some light tasks, a person can be highly engaged and learn all kinds of things um, in that uh, context. Um, I wanted to um, move ahead to this story, and I think this will help to, um, to consider the ideas of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion and developing environments like this. Uh, I attended, um, a games conference uh, a few years back. And there were a number of public school teachers who attended this conference and they were interested in, in developing games for learning. And so um, the person who was going to uh, conduct this workshop about developing games for learning decided that it would be a good idea to show as an example of a game, the game Sissy Fight. And this was a game in which players would take on the identity of a uh, child on a playground. And the, um, the object of the game was to uh, insult, ostracize, 
uh, one another and to try to group with others so as to um, cause one of the members to run away crying. So you can imagine the reaction uh, of the teachers, you know, this was absolutely the wrong kind of culture, the wrong kind of environment that we would want to create for learners, and certainly uh, not for uh, not for young learners. So this emphasizes that we have to pay attention to um, uh, to culture, to context, and to the consequences of the uh, designs that we, uh, that we create. And we should realize that when we're doing this, that we're creating um, not just new identities, but trajectories of the development of these identities. Uh, there was a game some years back called Fable in which the decisions that a person makes along the way turns them into um, a different kind of character along the way. And um, uh, it was a, a great example of how identity can be shaped through the trajectory of, uh, of play. Uh, I think um, I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna show this uh, example but there's some excellent uh, YouTube uh, videos uh, that are about uh, gender and the expression of gender in, um, uh, in video games. And so if you, um, if you uh, Google Anita uh, Sarkeesian, uh, you can find many of, of her videos that are really excellent about uh, gender and gender expression uh, in, in video games. So I wanted to uh, show a few examples of uh, gamification. They're all around us really in, um, in different corporate contexts and others. But I wanted to show uh, an example of some of, my, uh, of some of my own work and the game that myself and um, some of my uh, grad students uh, and colleagues designed called uh, SISEC. And this is a card game for the purpose of learning cybersecurity and basic computer science. So the point of, um, of this game is to teach some of these principles about computer science. And we started by working with um, children here in Chicago uh, at a variety of different schools and after school centers. And we started working up what would become a, a, a card game. And I found that uh, since uh, the vast majority of our students are African-American, that uh, many of the uh, girls of the age of about 12, 13, 14 were not very interested in the card game. But when we made African-American uh, female characters, they suddenly became engaged in this context. And so over time, we developed um, characters, a narrative, a story, and a way to try on different identities as hackers and as cybersecurity um, cyber security professionals. So the purpose was not only to teach about cybersecurity uh, uh, principles, but also to uh, motivate, motivate uh, children to um, explore the career of, um, of cybersecurity and computer science. And so this game ended up being something like card games such as Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, Pokemon, uh, Cardfight Vanguard, 
and others. So you can see, for example, in this, um, in this hacker, this hacker has a tech ability that is a certain uh, level. And that means the ability of them to do, um, uh, to use technology well. And then uh, data, how quickly they can move data. Talk, which means how well they can develop social phishing attacks. And then each hacker also has a rig that uh, has different characteristics and power, the CPU, the memory, and input output, um, the speed of their internet connection. So by engaging uh, the context of a story with uh, characters, with this, we were able, we were able to um, uh, show impact of both learning and also um, uh, motivation for the field of cybersecurity. Uh, by the way, when I first um, uh, proposed this, I, um, I proposed it to National Science Foundation and I went to the computer science department here at UIC. And in the beginning, really nobody wanted to work with me uh, because they didn't understand what a game like that uh, would look like. Um, but I was convinced that if we have an opponent kind of game that models the thinking of the cybersecurity professional or the hacker, you try this, then they try that. It's uh, like a chess game or jujitsu or, or judo or something like that, where you try new things and then try something else. And then that idea is thwarted. And then that idea is uh, thwarted yet again. Um, this is the part of the game called the main loop. And this is how turn taking is used in this context. And it situates the gameplay using uh, real life kinds of commands, which some of you might rec uh, recognize um, in uh, basic computer science and cybersecurity. So um, the next step um, is to create, uh, we already have this game, now this game is developed and we have the, um, uh, we have the processes, we have the characters, we have the artwork. The next step is to turn it into a, uh, a phone game, a game that's played on the phone. So hopefully National Science Foundation will fund me for that part as well. Uh, there have been other um, attempts at uh, using card games for learning sciences. So mine was um, one looking at the content of cybersecurity while particularly uh, uh, serving uh, African-American majority communities here in Chicago. Uh, but there are other ones as well, such as Molecules, which is uh, also a card game for learning chemistry. And um, what I wanted to do is uh, not just show uh, those examples, but uh, mention a few of the things that I've learned through the process of trying to uh, create games and simulations that are effective for teaching content as well as uh, motivating people. And I think the, uh, the first thing is that we've got to be flexible because what we're doing is uh, culture work. We're doing work that involves uh, creating contexts that, um, that nurture the emergence um, of this learning and also the emergence of, um, of cultures that support uh, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. So in doing this work, I think it's really important to be uh, flexible and adaptive. It's important to be able to think in new ways, right? So we can't just be uh, thinking in terms of black and white. Um, uh, you know, PC versus Mac, we have to be able to be flexibly adaptive and look at things in new ways. 
Uh, I feel that uh, another thing that uh, I've learned with this, um, with this design work is that it's very easy to go down rabbit holes. And so I say to my students now, beware of candy storing. You know, when you go into a candy store and everything looks really delicious. Oh, I want to try this. 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 But if you try too many things, then of course you get a stomach ache and uh, that's not good. So uh, sometimes we have to think, all right, let's finish this and um, make sure that that's working well before we try uh, too many other things. So when doing uh, this kind of design work, um, work together and help one another. And most of all, don't be afraid um, with, uh, with the work that you do. And I've learned a phrase uh, that I think expresses um, a good concept for people who do uh, design work, design for learning work. And that is um, from the Malay language, seek it, seek it, lama lama, jadi bukit, which means a little bit at a time uh, builds, uh, builds a mountain. All right, so I think I'm going to uh, conclude the comments uh, here and then maybe open it up for, um, for some questions and hopefully also maybe some uh, discussion. I'd be interested to hear about uh, your own design work uh, that you might be doing with games and simulations uh, for diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. Fantastic. That's This is a really interesting conversation to have and I think really important. Um, we do have a question from Tracy Moore who asks, in your opinion, why is it so difficult to bring gamification to K through 12 education when it appears to be happening in the corporate training world? Uh, you know, when I did this project, actually, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a very frustrating story. <laughs> um, I got schools to happily join, uh, join the project. I could convince uh, principals of schools. They said, okay, this sounds great. Do something after school, uh, fantastic. Um, but I was not able to get permission from Chicago public schools who have um, an RRB, which is like an IRB, um, uh, Institutional Review Board to do the research, right? Um, you know, schools, as you know, schools are uh, conservative kinds of environments. Uh, I don't mean politically conservative. I mean that they're not very fond of change, right? And they tend to also be um, uh, nervous about uh, making changes and what those changes might mean for the many other things that are going on. Uh, I think that's, you know, that's, that's the reality and that's what we have to deal with uh, when we deal with K-12 kinds of environments. Uh, the other thing about K-12 environments, and many of you who are teachers maybe uh, have experienced this, um, schools are burdened with a great deal of uh, accountability measures, right? So uh, they tend to be uh, very busy uh, justifying the things that they're doing. There are also many, many constituencies who are trying to get the attention of schools, right? Um, people say, oh, we want to do cybersecurity. We should do more of that in schools. Somebody else is saying, no, we should do more math in schools. Other people are saying we should do financial literacy. Other people are saying, oh, we should do media literacy. We should do this, we should do that. And so uh, a lot of the time, uh, teachers and schools, they tend to get a little bit overwhelmed by uh, people showing up and wanting to do stuff in the schools. So I think we have to, uh, we have to appreciate that with schools. Uh, I found that trying to do something during the school day uh, is very, very difficult because 
again, there's so much competition for the time. Um, I, I, I've gotten into a, a couple schools when I had a personal connection with, uh, with the teachers, um, uh, but to do things that are uh, large scale or even medium scale uh, is very tough. And I, I, I think when we're doing that type of thing, uh, this kind of work, we just have to uh, accept that because schools uh, tend to be uh, inherently uh, uh, conservative and because of the competition for time in the day and because of the way that teachers tend to be overburdened with, um, with accountability measures, it just can be um, a kind of tough. Uh, there's another thing that's going on, I think, with universities. So let's say I represent the University of Illinois and I show up at a school. Um, I have to also carry the baggage of other people who came from universities. So they might be thinking, you know what, last year we had this group come from your university or maybe another university and we weren't so happy with what happened. So, you know, that, that can create uh, issues at times as well. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I really feel that um, with a little persistence, things can go very, very well. So I wasn't able to go to this school, but I went to uh, another school uh, nearby. I wasn't able to uh, do everything that I wanted to do in Chicago public schools. Uh, but you know what? I found um, uh, a private school um, in the city, um, African-American majority school um, that happened to be Roman Catholic and very open to doing um, all kinds of things. Um, so I, I think it kind of comes with the um, comes with the territory. Uh, there are new rules also now um, for dealing with uh, with children, right? Um, background checks are usually required now, where they didn't used to be, and so you know, dealing with children just um, you know it it, it comes with uh, a lot that you just have to uh, kind of deal with that. Um, you know, maybe we're less burdened by these things in uh, corporate environments that are, you know, populated by adults. It's an interesting concept and takeaway on that regard, which we could have a whole nother conversation about another time, I believe. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody you might know named Scott Warren asks a question. Um, how did you include teachers and students in the analysis and design of the game to ensure their concerns and values were addressed in what you made? So we started out without anything. <laughs> um, when we first started uh, working with kids, uh, we didn't have any kind of game at all. And instead, what we did is we uh, created in a couple of schools what we called a cybersecurity club. And we played some other games that we didn't create. We um, uh, got uh, the kids and, and the adults that were there to talk to us about what they thought about those different games. And then we, over time, and we're talking about a couple, uh, a couple of years, uh, would show up with early designs of things. We would then collect um, um, uh, comments and um, even uh, artwork that uh, that kids provided to uh, to inform the design, uh, the designs that we um, um, that we were working on to uh, to create. Um, I, I, it's a slow process, right? Um, and I think that you know as as um, as you mentioned, Scott, the, I, the hope is that we can um, really ensure that their concerns and values are there. And I think by doing that uh, slow process, we can approach that. But I, I wouldn't be so uh, confident to say that we ever do it uh, perfectly. And when people play games, 
you know, some like them and some uh, some don't. Um, some uh, of the other teachers, uh, they like them and, and some don't. So I think that that's sort of an ongoing process and we have to look at that as uh, doing uh, culture work. We're working on, uh, on creating a culture that will nurture the emergence of these uh, you know, expertise and, uh, and motivation. Um, but we, we, never, we never finish. It's like the asymptotic curve or something. We never uh, perfectly share uh, the concerns and values of all players uh, all the time. But, but, that's, but that's the goal. And then we have a question from Aaron Howard who asks, I'm interested in gamification as a valuable tool in teaching and coaching UIL sports in universities and schools, especially to remove barriers of access to space and equipments. So what are your thoughts on gamification for teaching and coaching to increase equity and accessibility? So I think, um, uh, firstly, the notion of uh, accessibility is absolutely critical. That's um, part of diversity and um, uh, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. And so we have to um, continually work on uh, ways that the games that we create or the environments that we create uh, include, but maybe also exclude in some ways. So uh, using the example of the card game, uh, one thing that we realized with making a card game that it did create um, uh, a barrier for some students uh, who were not strong uh, readers, right? Uh, you might uh, remember uh, the Yu-Gi-Oh card that I showed in the in the PowerPoint presentation. There's a heck of a lot of a lot of text there, so we realized that wait a minute, we might be doing some excluding here by uh, uh, by using that text. So we worked over time to uh, decrease the amount of text to uh, rely more on uh, images rather than text. Um, but again, I think that this is something like uh, an ongoing, an ongoing process. Um, I'm interested in the idea of uh, sports here. I'm wondering if uh, Aaron might be um, uh, able to say a little bit more about um, about the context that they're working with. Aaron, would you like to jump on camera or turn your microphone on for a moment? Yes, I can turn my microphone on for me. Okay. So I'm actually at that point of my degree of looking at dissertation, and I'm looking at how if we could use virtual reality or if we could even use more gamification for students who are learning things such as, I'm looking specifically at the quickly growing sport of bass fishing, competitive bass fishing, and there's often not access to boats or access to lakes or access even because of the weather. And so gamification seemed like it would make practice a possibility, make people that maybe don't have as much because bass boats are very expensive, maybe people who don't have access to that type of equipment could still practice and improve and be a, a competitor. Yeah, so I think probably the thing to do with I mean, what I, what I would probably try to do is create some sort of uh, simulation. Uh, look at what are the, um, the constituent actions of bass fishing, and then uh, turn those into uh, a set of uh, procedures, right? The person does this, does this, and this and then look at difficulties, problems, and barriers that occur during those procedures. And then consider uh, bass, uh, uh, people who do bass fishing, right? Um, maybe you could uh, interview uh, people who are engaged in bass fishing and try to come 
um, uh, come to an account of what their central concerns are with bass fishing. And then once you have an idea of like, what is it that they care about the most? Uh, what are their central concerns? And then look at how is it that they continually engage some kind of behavior, right? They're continually doing something in order to address those central concerns. So, um, all right, I'm an expert. Um, I'm an expert in bass fishing, uh, but you know what? This is what I'm always worried about. This is what I'm always concerned about when I'm, um, when I'm doing my bass fishing. It might have to do with the tools. It might have to do with context. It might have to do with uh, things that uh, if you're not uh, doing bass fishing would not occur to you. So understand the concerns and then understand the behaviors of the things that they do and then uh, find a way to simulate or tell a story about or put someone on some kind of path that involves uh, activities that model uh, those activities of, uh, of bass fishing. Uh, you, you did mention um, uh, virtual reality or online virtual environments. I think that's very, very promising. Uh, by the way, one of the major activities in uh, World of Warcraft that I showed one of the professions is fishing. And it's not uh, designed to be very, um, uh, very deep or um, uh, is not trying to be a real uh, simulation, um, but it is uh, an activity in the game and a person has to do different kinds of fishing behaviors in order to catch different types of fish and use different types of tools in order to, to catch different types of fish. So if I want to catch high level fish in a high level uh, body of water, I have to use a high level um, fishing pole and I can augment them with different kinds of lures. Um, but in creating a, you know, an actual uh, simulation, I think getting at the, or doing some epistemography of expert, um, experts in bass fishing would, um, uh, would be a smart way to go. Uh, by the way, um, if you're designing your uh, dissertation study now, um, I've noticed over the years that it's really, really a great idea to uh, come up with a parsimonious list of well-articulated questions that will become research questions later on and really anchor the study with the research questions. Because once you have a good question, then you can have a good idea of what data you have to collect in order to answer the question, what kind of analysis of that data or what you have to do with that data in order to answer that research question. And then consider what the answer um, uh, I go like this when I say answer, because it could be more complex than an answer. But what is the answer to that research question? And then play with what that anticipated answer might be and what your questions are in advance of uh, actually collecting, uh, collecting data. So um, best of luck to you, Aaron, and you know, Thank go you for it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Go for it. And then we have time if you're game, Dr. Thomas. I didn't game. go for the pun, but it happened. <laughs> um, there's one more question. So are there any tips or insights you have discovered when creating games targeting professional adults through the lens of DNI? Well, um, this is something that uh, you know I, I have dealt mostly with um, with children. But I do think that we have to um, kind of engage the elephant in the room uh, when we're talking about uh, diversity, when we talk about equity, when we talk about inclusion, um, we do encounter some, we're engaging a conversation that can be uncomfortable, right? That can be, um, uh, you might say off-putting, right? Um, and so I, I feel that when we're engaged in this kind of work, 
we have to be careful not to um, not to unintentionally attack a person's sense of self or a person's sense of uh, identity, uh, but rather explore the issues through uh, a lens of um, through a lens of optimism, through a lens of um, creating environments that give rise to um, uh, to learning and actions that will make people more powerful for doing what they already uh, want to do. Um, so this is kind of the uh, uh, the work that uh, that we're engaged in. And again, I, I started by saying that um, you know we say uh, no to despair and yes to hope in education because the fruits of what we do when we design learning environments or when we do uh, uh, teaching are something that we might not see uh, for a very, very um, uh, long, uh, long time. And perhaps that act of discovery is a portion of this conversation here. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Wonderful. So I think we will conclude with that. I don't see any additional questions, but I would like to thank you so much for your time today. This was a really interesting and important conversation to have, and I believe it'll continue as we go further forward in this entire field. But um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And please join me in thanking Dr. Thomas for his time today. And we're so thank excited. You, thank you so much. That you joined the discovery lecture series with us um for those who are on the call if you are interested in our upcoming discovery series lectures we have several planned for fall and more coming soon so i'll post in the chat a link and um we'll do that but again thank you so much and we hope you all have a wonderful day and this recording will be posted on our youtube page and shared um, in the next few days Thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time.